Hypokalemia treatment consists of two arms that should be done simultaneously. The treatment of the underlying cause or problem and the potassium replacement therapy to replace the potassium deficit. In today's video, we'll discuss the potassium replacement therapy. I will not discuss the underlying problem and how to treat them. If you would like to receive a written summary of this video, please subscribe to my Substack page. A link is provided below, as well as a link to my previous video, the treatment of acute hyperkalemia. Let's start. Potassium supplement can be given through oral or enteral route or through parenteral or IV route. Mild to moderate hypokalemia should be treated with oral potassium only, while IV potassium should be reserved for severe or symptomatic hypokalemia. Also, IV potassium supplements can be used in mild to moderate hypokalemia if enteral route is contraindicated. For example, the patient is in PO or in shock with poor absorption status, then we use IV potassium. We'll come to this later on. As all of you know, normal potassium level is 3 0.5 to 5 or some institution use 5.5 milli equivalent per liter. So based on that, any potassium between 3 to 3.5 is considered mild, 2.5 to 3 considered moderate, and anything less than 2.5 considered severe. Also, the presence of any symptoms, symptomatic hypokalemia regardless of the level of potassium is considered severe hypokalemia. So what kind of symptoms we're looking here? Any EKG changes or arrhythmias, muscular weakness, and rhabdomyolysis. Rarely these symptoms will be seen at this level, sometimes or occasionally seen at this level, but most of these symptoms happen when the potassium is less than 2.5 at this category. So what are these EKG changes? We have wide range of EKG changes can be seen in hypokalemia, QT prolongation, ST depression, U waves, premature atrial complexes, premature ventricular complexes, sinus bradycardia and AV node block, paroxysmal atrial or junctional tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation, and of course, cardiac arrest. That's why it's very important that any hypokalemia patient should get a 12 lead EKG and should be placed on telemetry. Now, there are a subset of patients who have the highest risk to develop such arrhythmias. Who are those? Patients on digoxin or anti, any other antiarrhythmic drugs. Patients who are already on medication that can prolong QT interval. Patients with coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and other structural heart disease. And of course, patients with history of previous arrhythmias. So what potassium levels we trying to achieve when we treating hypokalemia? In most patients, including cardiac patients, we're trying to keep the potassium equal or above 3.5 milli equivalent per liter. Again, this including cardiac patient. I know a lot of you heard or already practiced that we need to get this to four milli equivalent or equal or above four in cardiac patient, but there is really no strong evidence of that. Just remember this number and you should be safe. Patients with potassium at this level or higher should not have any risk of developing arrhythmias or EKG changes. Now, there are two exceptions to this. First, renal failure patients, whether acute or chronic. In these patients, the target we're trying to achieve is equal or above of three milli equivalent per liter. The second exception is patients who have DKA or non-ketotic hypo, hyperismal or hyperglycemia. These patients have two issues here. They already have large potassium deficit, but despite this large potassium deficit, potassium may be normal or elevated on the blood work because we are talking about the serum potassium in the extracellular fluid. Add to that that these patients need to be on insulin drip soon. So the target for these patients to keep their potassium, remember that, 5 to 5.3. So these patients need potassium supplements if the potassium is less than 5. Before we dig further into the treatment, I want to take a second talk about the spurious or false hypokalemia. This is way less common than the spurious hyperkalemia. And it can happen mainly when there is extreme leukocytosis. And remember, extreme leukocytosis can cause false hyperkalemia and false hypokalemia, especially if the tube, if after they draw the blood, the, the blood stay in the tube for a prolonged period of time before running the test. So remember, it's not that common, but keep it in your mind, especially when you have extreme leukocytosis or if you have no reason to believe this patient is having hypokalemia or should have hypokalemia. Now, never forget about the magnesium. Any case of hypokalemia, we need to check magnesium level. 
And this is particularly important if the hypokalemia related to potassium loss rather than the redistribution of potassium. Magnesium depletion leads to potassium renal loss. So magnesium must be corrected to correct hypokalemia. So never forget about checking magnesium level and repleting hypomagnesemia, otherwise it will be difficult to treat hypokalemia. Now we decided to give potassium to our patients. Now there's a few questions we need to answer. First is how much potassium should I give? Second, should I give it oral or IV? Third, what kind of potassium preparation should I use? Fourth, how do I give it? And fourth, how to monitor that. There are a few things very important to understand before we go into the potassium deficits. This is the intracellular space and this is the extracellular one. As you see, the concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluids is three to five mil equivalent. And this is what we see in the blood work, the extracellular fluid. While the concentration in the intracellular fluid is 140 mil equivalent. That tells you that the vast majority of body potassium lives right here in the intracellular cellular space which means when we see a drop of potassium level here even a small drop that's probably means a large deficit that happens here that now reflected as a small drop in the extracellular fluid and what also this means that the relation between the extracellular fluid potassium concentration and the potassium deficits is exponential as you see in this graph here a small drop in the potassium it will mean large body deficits of potassium it's very important that all this talk about the body deficits apply to hypokalemia that related to potassium loss whether renal or extra renal it does not apply if the hypokalemia related to shifting from extracellular to intracellular or what we call redistribution because in shifting or redistribution the total body potassium is the same there is no deficit in that it's just the shifting or redistribution and that's very important when we replete potassium in those patients we need to be very careful with the close monitoring of their potassium level and i will come to that so use this the estimation of body potassium deficits if the hypokalemia is solely due to potassium loss with a renal or extra renal. So here's an equation that will give you an estimate. Again, all of this will give you rough estimates. This is the daily potassium requirement, which is around millimole mean mill equivalent per kg of body weight. So it's very important when you calculate the deficits that you add the daily potassium requirement to that deficits. Let's say we have a patient who is 100 kilogram and potassium is 2.5 milli equivalent per liter and the patient having let's say diarrhea severe diarrhea so he's losing potassium through his gut so what's the potassium deficits here so the deficits will equal to normal lower limit which is let's say in our hospital 3.5 minus the patient potassium which is 2.5 multiplied by the body weight which is 100 multiplied by 0.4 and this will give us 40 milli equivalent add to that the daily requirement which is one milli equivalent per kg that means it will be another 100 milli equivalent so the total deficits will be 140 milli equivalent again remember this is a rough estimate that's why we give this amount in divided doses not all at once to make sure we don't over treat this and cause hyperkalemia so for example i could give this 140 milli equivalent let's say over um, 24 hours and maybe i need to give a dose every six hours so 140 divided by four doses that's equal if 35 milli equivalent every six hours the next question do we give it orally the potassium or iv iv potassium supplement should be reserved for severe hypokalemia cases or symptomatic hypokalemia cases or if the patient in or we cannot give it by mouth or there is poor absorption like in shock status and for mild and moderate hypokalemia we use only oral potassium supplements now as you know iv raise potassium level quickly and for that reason we cannot exceed certain rate with iv administration i will discuss that soon while on the other hand oral formulation raise potassium slowly that makes oral potassium to be safer and of course is cheaper and the risk of hyperkalemia is low allowing the, us to give larger amount of potassium without the concern of having rebound hyperkalemia 
On the other hand, the IV potassium is expensive, irritates the veins and cause phlebitis, which can make it very difficult to access these veins in the future. So that's why we always prefer to use oral potassium. Also, one drawback with IV potassium that we have a limit in on the infusion rate. Here on the oral, we can give larger amount of potassium, while here we are limited because remember, we are afraid that if we give too much of potassium, we raise the potassium level quickly in the serum and cause hyperkalemia. I'll discuss this in detail soon. So what are the available potassium preparations? The most widely used and well-known is the potassium chloride, KCL, available in oral and IV, and the oral one is available in pills, powders, and liquids or elixir form. The second one is potassium potassium phosphate and I would only think about this if there is a combination hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia it's available in oral I and IV. Potassium bicarbonate, potassium citrate and potassium acetate what connect them the acid citrate and acetate are precursor to bicarb. They are metabolized into bicarb when it gets into the body by the liver. Uh, the citrate and bicarb available in oral form only and the acetate in IV form only. As you can guess they are best to be given if if there is hypokalemia associated with bicarb loss, and that means bicarb loss means normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Now we decided the amount of deficits and we decided what kind of potassium preparation we're going to use. How do we administer that? Now for oral potassium, we give the total deficit, the total amount, we give it in divided doses, preferably three to four doses a day. If the deficit, let's say 120 milli equivalent, I can give this as 40 milli equivalent PO Q8 hours times three doses, for example. Remember that oral potassium is safe and rarely leads to hyperkalemia compared to the IV potassium. Now, the IV potassium can lead to a quick rise in the serum potassium, and that's why we need to be careful how do we give it. If we using IV potassium to treat mild to moderate hypokalemia, we give it a 10 milli equivalent per hour, and this can be given safely through peripheral IV. If we're treating severe or symptomatic hypokalemia, we need to raise the potassium level quickly so we can go up to 20 milli equivalent per hour. And it's preferred for this rate and 20 milli equivalent per hour or above to use central line instead. If there is no central line, what you could do, let's say the 20, you can split them into 10 milli equivalents to be given in two peripheral IVs simultaneously. Now, DK and non ketotic hyperismal or hyperglycemia, these patients, we need to start insulin drip as soon as possible and you know insulin shift potassium intracellularly. They already have large deficits of potassium as we explained from osmotic diuresis. We cannot start insulin drip unless the potassium is equal or above 3.3 milli equivalent. Some say 3.5. So if the potassium is less than that, so if the potassium is less than this, we cannot start the insulin drip. So we need to quickly raise their potassium level, and that's why we go to a higher rate, 20 to 40 milli equivalent per hour. It's okay to go as high as 40 milli equivalent per hour, as long as you are monitoring that, and we'll come to monitoring soon. Now, cardiac arrest patients are exceptions. Here, the patient's dying, has no pulse. And if it's, if you are very sure it's from hypokalemia, so you have to be sure, or at least have a strong suspicion this is from hypokalemia then you can infuse it quickly 10 to 20 milli equivalent over five minutes and this is the only time that we give potassium that fast but the patient is dead or dying and we need to save the patient life now let's say you gave the patient potassium the patient got his pulse back and then lost the pulse again in this case and you still believe it's from hypokalemia you can infuse potassium at 60 milli equivalent per hour now we gave potassium how to monitor that remember all of them should be on telemetry EKG 12 lead EKG for all for mild hypokalemia we can repeat potassium with next morning labs there is no need to repeat it the same day now moderate hypokalemia depends how low it is it we repeat it every 6 to 8 to 12 hours severe hypokalemia repeated in 2 to 4 hours now if the potassium is infused at a rate of 40 milliequivalent per hour or more check potassium every 60 minutes and we finish monitoring by remembering that potassium levels should not be obtained directly from a line where potassium potassium is being infused with our pick line, peripheral line, central line. This will give you falsely elevated potassium. Potassium supplement should be provided until we achieve our target level. Replete magnesium if magnesium deficiency exists. Remember that. And don't forget to treat the underlying problems. And one last thing I want to mention here, potassium sparing diuretic.
diuretics should be considered in hypokalemia secondary to other types of diuretics, whether carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, loop diuretics, or thiazide diuretics. In the end, if you'd like again to receive a summary of this video, please subscribe to my Substack. The link is provided below. If you find this video useful, please give it a like, share it with your colleagues, and thanks for watching.